is not phage display. But don't worry, phage display is actually even cooler. It's a way that we can get bacteria infecting viruses called phages to display little bits of protein. And this allows us to do things like find antibodies that bind and from like combinatorial libraries and to find where antibodies bind and to do all of this really, really cool stuff. A lot of stuff other than just antibodies, um, some really, really cool work. Um, so phage display is this really versatile technique and it was first invented in 1985. Um, well, at least the first proof of concept was shown by Gregory Winter. Um, he and George Smith would win the Nobel Prize for it in 2018, um, which they shared with Francis Arnold, who's really awesome too. Um, and this technique is just really, really cool. And so I want to tell you more about it, how it works, some of the uses. Um, so yeah, this thing is, crazy useful like Humira the um the drug Humira it was one of the best selling drugs it was made during using um phage display technology um to go through all of these libraries of potential antibody and find this antibody, um, humanize a mouse, mouse antibody using this technique um and developing this drug that is super duper useful. So as I mentioned, there are a lot of different variations to phage display, and there are a lot of different um, techniques that you can use to optimize for various things, and I'll get into some of these. But first, here's just the general overview of how it works, and then we'll get way into the details. So if some of these terms don't sound like familiar to you now, don't worry, we're going to um, dive into them, and hopefully you'll be less confused by the end. So basically, a phage is a bacteriophage. It's a virus that infects bacteria. And what you do is you get this bacteriophage to display a fusion protein. So basically it has its protein, but then you stick a bit of a protein you want it to show into its protein, um, into this protein that sticks off the surface of this phage. So what happens is that you can create like a library of millions of different phage clones where you insert foreign DNA into this coat protein gene, then it's going to because DNA has instructions for making protein, this is gonna add a little bit of that protein. It's gonna modify the protein, so it's displaying your protein in its protein. And then because you're making this library with millions of these different clones, you're gonna have lots and lots of different versions of this phage. Then you, what you can do is you can basically mix them, you can get them to infect bacteria, and so you can make a lot, a lot of them. Well, you, well, now you want to find the ones that are going to bind to something of interest. So there are different ways that you can do this. So basically, sometimes this is called like biopanning too. You can, you need to like immobilize the target of interest. So this can be like on a plate. Sometimes it's on beads. And you basically mix your phage library that's displaying all of these different protein bits that you want to test and then you see which ones bind. So you mix the phages with the thing that the immobilized target, the ones that bind are going to stick, the ones that don't bind aren't going to stick. And so you can wash off those non-specific binders, such as with um, increasing the salt concentration. After you wash it, you're gonna be left with ones that stick. Um, but these might not be the best ones that's like super duper great stickers, but they're, they're at least, um, moderate stickers that they were able to survive the wash. Then you want to elute, so you want to unstick these specific binders, which you can do using slightly harsher conditions, such as changing the pH. And now what you're going to do is you're going to take those phage that you have just eluted, so these should be the specific binders, and you typically want to make a lot more of them because you're going to want to isolate its DNA, and so you want to have lots of copies of the DNA. And we can use, you can use techniques to make more copies of that in vitro, so like outside of these phages, but you want to have more to start with so that you don't, it doesn't just get lost in the noise. So in the amplify step, you let these phages infect more bacteria to make more. So that's the great thing about these phages is that they have like the bacteria infecting viruses. So they're already good at getting into bacteria and getting bacteria to make lots of copies of them. And so we can get bacteria to make lots of copies of them, which is how we can do these techniques where we're testing like millions of different phages. And it's not like incredibly overwhelming because it's, well, we like make the bacteria do the hard work for us. 
And so the bacteria are going to make lots of copies of this phage. And then these phages, now we can look and see what, what the DNA was that was connected to the binding protein. So the protein that's on the surface is going to be the protein that was instructed by the DNA that we inserted. But remember, this is typically like a random library. So there can be tons and tons of different stuff in, in here, and we don't know what it is. So we have these millions of different phages with these millions of different proteins corresponding to millions of different DNA sequences. And we need to find out what the DNA sequence was that caused this protein to be made that was specifically bound. And so you can sequence this um, so you don't have to sequence the whole thing because you know what the region was around like of this fusion gene and stuff. You know the region where you inserted the foreign DNA. So now you can amplify that region or you, you can sequence that region to find what the DNA was that was inside of there. And now what you can do is you can take that DNA and you can clone it into some other expression vector, um, such as like a plasmid, so a circular piece of DNA we can put into bacterial cells and get the bacteria cells to make more of the protein and then we can like purify it off, purify it out, and then we can test it for various functions. Sometimes too, because you do this, you often do this in multiple, multiple rounds though. So there's a few reasons for this. One is that you can keep making the wash conditions harsher so that you don't, so that you find the best of the best. You can also, because there's going to be some random mutations introduced throughout this process, because when you're making, when the phage is making lots of copies, then there's going to be some mutations introduced because nothing's perfect when it's doing the copying process. So these mutations might make the binding worse, but they might also make the binding better. And so if they make the binding worse, then those are just going to get washed off, especially since you have harsher conditions. But if the mutations, these random mutations, happen to make the binding stronger, now those mutations are going to survive the harsher conditions, and so you're going to end up enriching for even by their binders. To make this even more um, likely, you can actually use like mutator strains um, where, the where there's less error correction and there's more mutation prone um, to, uh, copying so that mutations are more likely and therefore you're more likely to, you have like faster um, evolution of the binding partner. So there are lots of different um, combinations that you can imagine using phage display. So you can, we'll talk a lot about, a lot of the technologies are for antibodies. So you can have antibodies, um, oh, so you can find antibodies, you can find what antibodies bind to. So basically, if you want to find antibodies, you can stick antibody genes into here and have little bits of antibodies, little antibodies displayed from the surface, and then have something you want to test if the antibodies bind to. You can also do the opposite. So if you want to find what an antibody binds to, so that is the antigen or, or the epitope of a specific antigen, so like the exact site it binds to, you can stick um, different things into here, like different peptides. You can stick like little short pieces of DNA for various peptides. And then these peptides will be displayed. And then you can see, uh, find, the, find which antibodies bind to it. Um, and so you can test various things, like what might be some auto reacting, auto, auto antibody reactive things, um, viral reacting things, various really cool things. And then you can kind of like reverse engineer in all sorts of ways, um, as well as find drugs that bind specific peptides, find peptides that bind specific drugs, all sorts of really cool techniques for when you want to test a lot, a lot of things. Um, have the potential for some molecular evolution and various things. So really, really cool technique. And now let's get into the details. Okay, so let's start with this phage. Um, so a phage, phage is short for bacteriophage. And there, we use phages a lot in biochemistry. So actually yesterday, um, in my post yesterday, I was talking about the um, Hershey Chase experiments. And in that case, they were using a um, T2 phage um, to help show that nucleic acids and not protein were the source of genetic information. This is a different type of phage. So it's this T2 phage, you can see it has this kind of like 
shell, like structurally shelly thing. Um, and then it has this linear double-stranded DNA genome. The phages that we're using for phage display are a different type of phage. They're called filamentous phages. Um, it includes like M13, F1, and FD. They have a singular, they have a single strand circular DNA genome. Um, and then they have this long filamentous shape. They enter bacteria after docking onto this bacterial epilis um, and then like injecting their DNA inside. They have a simple genome, which is good when you want to manipulate things. And basically they have a few different pro multiple coat proteins. So coat proteins are the ones that are like out on the surface. And so some of them are like really important for getting the antibacteria and some of them there are parts of them that we can add things to. So we want to add things to the part that's actually going to stick out um, of the phage. And so a lot of work um, was done, for example, in that key early paper, but to determine where in this phage is best for display. There are a few different, there are a couple options that are often used. Um, most typically this like P3, as well as sometimes P8. So P8, it has about like 2,700 copies of it, which you might think would be really, really good, but it's kind of like way too much. So you kind of, if you have a lot of copies of something, things can stick even if like one copy alone wouldn't be strong enough to stick. Um, so we'll get more into this idea of avidity later, but where you have a lot of copies of something, then if they're kind of all weakly binding, it can kind of build together and help make a stronger binding. And so this P8 um, is less than ideal, but the rest of the pro proteins have about five copies and P3, is this one that is really, really useful because it like sticks out and you have like five copies of it. And so it, al and it allows sort of some flexibility for you to insert foreign protein. But what you're not, you're actually inserting the foreign DNA to make, telling it to make the protein. And so we call this like a fusion protein where you have like its protein with a bit of your protein fused into it. And so it's actually typically fused not into the actual like end because that needs to be used to attach to the, the bacteria and stuff. So, but you can stay kind of like in the middle and there are different spots where people stick things. But you can stick in different, fusion, different bits of DNA and get it to display different fusion proteins. And then you can create a library of different ones, test if they bind things, and then look back and see what the foreign DNA binders had. So if we go back to our panning strategy, we would basically get these to bind and then get amplify them and then look and sequence what was in here. This is super duper useful because there are so many possible combinations that can be used to make a protein. So there are 20 um, common amino acids or protein letters, and you can have these different combinations of them. And so there are just like, so proteins are made up of these combinations of them, different proteins have different combinations of them and have then the different combinations are gonna affect how they fold and function. There are techniques where you can try to predict what, um, how proteins fold. There's a lot of progress on that front but there's still just so many possible combinations that we need a way to kind of test them all, which is where phase display comes in really handy because we don't have to, basically we don't have to waste our, too much time with the ones that aren't helpful because those ones just won't get selected. So we make that big library and then the ones that aren't useful will just get washed off and the ones that are useful we get to keep. So it's kind of like a brute force cracking approach except that there's no one right solution. There can be lots of solutions. And so this is one of the reasons why this is great um, because we're doing it, you can do this like a random library. And so you're not like biasing it in terms of like getting stuck going down one path to find the one perfect thing by allowing there to be multiple really good things. Um, so you can allow this diversity and um, really this 
and you're testing actual direct binding as instead of just like um, prediction stuff. So anyway, it's really, really cool. Um, and that was not meant as a dig at prediction stuff. And it's like the, the better you can actually mix the two and stuff. So you can use this technique you can bias your library going into it. If you have an idea of what might find well, you can use a smaller library to stick in those things. Um, so you can make a library say from blood in a person that was infected with a various disease in order to try to isolate antibodies um, from that patient's blood. You can also try to do, you can also do things like you take the take those initial hits that you get and then use computational methods and pre, uh, molecular prediction and that sort of thing in order to try to improve the binding. And then you can even use phages to test the various improvements. And um, although if you don't have that many, you would probably do some smaller scale thing. So I've been talking a lot about antibodies. So let's get into um, how this all works. <laughs> Um, and so an antibody is just this little protein that binds to some specific thing. And so we call the specific thing it binds to an antigen and the exact region on the antigen where it binds, we call the epitope. The, the antibody is actually going to bind to the antigen in the special antigen binding sites. And what's special about them is that these parts are unique. So each antibody um, has unique variable regions, and these variable regions are where the antigen binding sites are located. So there are different types of antibodies. This is an IgG antibody, which is typically what is, um, this is like the most common one that you see in diagrams and that sort of thing, and what's typically used in therapeutics. Um, these are Y-shaped, they have this constant region, and then the variable regions. What happens in your body and in the body of animals is that different there are genes for different variable regions. And what happens in your antibody making cells, your B cells, they can kind of randomly choose which to make. Once they make a choice, then they're stuck with it because they actually edit their DNA so that they piece together different versions of those variable regions to make a unique antibody. And since they're editing it out, then they can only ever make that one. But if they happen to get selected for, if they happen to bind to something that is foreign and not um, self -rec doesn't rec and not bind, it doesn't bind to something that is not foreign, they'll get selected for and more of that antibody will be made. And then they can even undergo further like somatic hypermutation um, where some Changes can be made kind of like how we talked about uh, after the selection, like the different rounds you can introduce mutations. That sort of thing can happen with these somatic hypermutations, so you make better and better antibody binders. But the complicated thing is that, and what makes this so great, is that you have so many different options that these B cells can choose from, that there's so much potential diversity um, and the phage just blaze a way for us to kind of recreate that diversity and do this selection in a non-body way. So basically those, there's actually multiple of those generic, of those unique parts that combine to make those antigen binding sites. And then, so this, the constant region is, I should mention, is constant for a given organism. So our constant chains are going to be different than like mouse constant chains, different from goat constant chains and rabbit constant chains, which is why we can use antibodies against these constant regions when we're using like secondary antibodies in Western blots and stuff. If that doesn't make sense, don't worry. You, need to, you don't need to know about it for this post. Um, just if you were curious, I like to throw in those tidbits to other techniques that make connections. And if I have posts on Western blocks, if you're confused, we can go into that. But these have, the antibodies have a heavy chain and a light chain, constant regions and unique regions. So you have a constant heavy, a constant light, variable heavy, and a variable light. Because that we're interested in these variable regions, 
we're typically talking about this variable light and the variable heavy chains. So each of these parts has a, its own corresponding gene, and then the different antibodies are formed by mixing and matching different versions of those genes. So this is what's happening in those B cells when they're like choosing randomly what antibody to, to devote their life to making. And so the antigen binding site is going to be formed from a combination of both these heavy and these light variable chains. So what we can do is we can create a phase display library of antigen binding sites by mixing and matching the genes for different variable chains. And then it's making fusion proteins where we stick them in the phage coat protein and get them displayed. And then use our infinity selection or like bio panning to see which ones bind and then isolate the BH and BL genes from those phages. Um, so sounds great, right? But there can be issues. Although antibodies are small for proteins, they're big for sticking onto phages. So normally we only stick on parts of them. So remember we're sticking this protein kind of like into this phage's normal protein and so we need to make sure that we're not just messing up the phage, um, in which case we wouldn't, this technique would not be helpful. But what is helpful to us is that the, we don't need this, the constant region is gonna stay constant. And what we care most about are these variable regions. This constant region is really important in our body and that sort of thing for helping it attach to various receptors and get splayed and all this stuff. I'm not an immunologist, so I'm not gonna to try to get into that too much. But I'm not saying the constant region doesn't matter, it does. But in terms of binding, then we care about the variable regions. So we can just stick the variable regions on there. So the, this like SCFV, this is like the tip of one of these arms of the Y. It only has the variable regions for each heavy and light chain connected with the linker. And you can also stick just the individual variable heavy and variable light chains. You can also stick in the fab, which is like a single arm of the Y, so it also has part of the constant regions. So this is a powerful technique for developing therapeutic antibodies. So you probably have heard about therapeutic antibodies in the context of the coronavirus and how like neutralizing antibodies like mono monoclonal antibodies or antibody cocktails can be used to block the, to bind to the spike protein of the coronavirus and keep it from getting into cells. But antibodies in, are actually like a huge market for therapeutics. And in like 2016, like six of the top 10 selling um, drugs were monoclonal antibodies. And so when you see and when you see drug names that end with AB, that's for antibody. And so antibodies are so useful because they can bind to specific things. And so they can say bind to and block various proteins involved in various diseases, um, including the coronavirus, but not just the coronavirus. So scientists have a big interest in developing antibodies. Common ways for developing antibodies um, include traditional ways like injecting an animal with something that you want to act as an antigen, letting the animal make the antibodies, and then the antibodies will be secreted into the blood and you can isolate them. If you typically when you want to get monoclonal antibodies, so you want to isolate like a specific version. So remember like they, this, there's gonna be lots of different B cells making lots of different antibodies in this mass that bind to the various, the antigen that you want. Typically, if you want, to, you're interested in these like monoclonal antibodies and we're talking about therapeutic purposes, especially because we're going to want to make a lot of that. So we want to isolate the DNA for making this. With monoclonal antibodies, we need to isolate like the DNA for making it or isolate the cell that it came from and then copy. So the different techniques like hybridoma or sticking their, copying their antibody DNA, sticking it in expression cells and getting them to make more. Um, with a hybridoma, you fuse the, a B cell, so an antibody making cell with the tumor cell to make a hybridoma, which can then grow and produce the antibodies. But there are, there's obviously um, strong interest in trying to make techniques that avoid having to use an animal step. 
not just for the protection of the animals and but also that these antibodies are going to be have the antibody the constant regions of the animal that they were made in unless you're using some sort of specialized um, animal that's been humanized so there are some like mice with humanized antibodies so they have like human and human constant regions but if you could just bypass all of that and directly engineer human antibodies with a phage library, then that's even better. Um, so there are huge, like, um, huge libraries of the human antibody. Um, a lot of this work has been done by Greg Winter, where he actually like amplified the variable, re the variable regions of human antibodies. And then you can mix and match and make different phages that are displayed and selected for. So you can actually do this with, because different people are going to have different libraries because they have already gone through the selection process. So you can kind of make it just super duper generic, like every single possible combination. But if you want, you can start by like, say if a person was, had recovered from a various disease, they would likely have antibodies that were good at, um, that recognized the proteins from, from that virus or from that bacteria. And so then you could make libraries from their lymphocytes in particular and kind of start, um, get a head start in the race with your, with your panning. Speaking of getting a head start, um, so the drug Humira, it is an antibody, a monoclonal antibody against TNF alpha, tumor necrosis factor alpha, which is involved in some autoimmune diseases. The antibody that was made was made during using phage display, and it's a human antibody, but it was actually made based off of a mouse, humanizing a mouse antibody in a way. So they had this mouse antibody that they knew was really, really good at binding TNF alpha. And so they, what they did was they took the variable regions of this mouse antibody and they mixed and matched them with variable regions of human antibodies. So they would take the mouse H and the mouse VH, so the variable H heavy and the variable light, mix them with the human heavy and the human light and find the human versions that um, went well kind of with them and then mix those human versions um, and do this selection this, and so they're able to make a full human antibody so they don't have to worry about the human's body recognizing the antibody as foreign. And as I was mentioning before, you can also kind of do the opposite. So you can stick various potential epitopes. So we can get these to display like peptides or little proteins, various things that you want to see what the antibody is binding to. And then you can take a single antibody and see what it's binding to. So you're kind of doing this in reverse. This kind of harkens back to what George Smith originally thought was gonna be useful for, for like cloning genes when you didn't know what the gene um, was. So if you had like an antibody against a specific protein, but you had no clue what that protein was or what like DNA coded for it, then you could stick random pieces of DNA into this phage, have them displayed, immobilize the antibody against the protein and therefore select for the phages that had the DNA that corresponded to the thing that the antibody bound to. And that way, figure out its sequence. If you can find that little piece, um, then you can use that piece to like fish out the whole gene for the product. So I also get into a little more technical notes. Um, so although we, so the P3 is only only has like five copies. Um, sometimes these can get cut off too, so you might not even get five full copies. But five is sometimes too much. There's and sometimes you just want one. So one would be like a monovalent display, and this has to do with affinity and avidity. So affinity is how well each protein binds independently, and the avidity is the effects that come from multiple proteins. Um, working together. It's easier for one to bind if there's another already tethered nearby. 
So you can imagine if you have something with a bunch of binding sites and if one binds, um, this other one falls off, but it's still stuck there because it's the one next to it's bound. So then it comes back and it's like kind of like increasing your local concentration, um, increasing the probability of binding. If what you care about is what you, like what one, how well one copy binds. So say if you were going to use some sort of antibody in a monomer form, where you're just sticking like a single IgG chain in there. So you don't wanna be like fooled into thinking that your antibody binds really well, when it's really just this avidity effect that's coming from this polyvalent display. So polyvalent meaning that there's multiple copies available for like binding. So this polyvalency is what's going to happen normally because you have those about five um, P3 copies. But there are ways that you can get monovalent display. There are some different ways, but um, commonly you do this using a phage mid and a helper phage. So basically this a phage mid, so you might have heard about plasmid, the circular piece of DNA we often stick into um, bacteria and the bacteria can kind of host it separately from their own genome and make copies of it. And so a plasmid has an origin of replication or initiation sequence for the bacteria. So the bacteria can make copies of it and it can be propagated in bacteria separately from the bacterial chromosome. A phage um, is a virus that infects bacteria and it has its own origin of replication. And a phage mid is a sort of hybrid. So it has some of the phage genes and the phage origin of replication, but not enough to make, not enough of the genes to make functional phage. So basically it's gonna act as a plasmid until you give it a helper phage that has the things that it needs that it's lacking. So the, Phage mids, um, so they typically have like an antibiotic resistant selection gene too. Um, so you can select for the bacteria that have them. Then they have the E. coli replication and then they have their own origin of replication. And, but in these phage mids, they don't have everything that you need. So they don't have say the things that they need to make the things that they need to like secrete themselves and coat themselves and all of those various things. So they need help. And this is where you can use a helper phage to add those other phage genes that they don't have and allow phage to get made. So if you take a, you take make a fusion protein where the P3 protein is in a phage mid. So your phage mid is going to have the gene for the P3 protein. But then the other phage genes are going to be provided by a helper phage. You can let this bacteria grow with just your phage mid, but they're not going to be, they're going to be able to keep and copy this P3 plasmid, but they're not going to be making actual phage until you add a helper protein. When you add a helper phage, or sorry, when you add a helper phage, when you add a helper phage, you can add a helper phage that has a normal version of the P3 because this version of P3, the normal one, doesn't have this bit of random protein stuck into it, it's going to be more stable and it's going to be better incorporated. So most of the phage is actually just going to be the wild type, um, but some of it is going to be the one with, going to have a fusion protein. And importantly, you're not typically, you're not likely to have ones with more than one fusion protein. You're going to have a lot without any, but those are just going to get washed off because they're not going to get bind. So it's not like fully efficient, um, but you shouldn't have polyvalency. Another thing is that the origin of replication for the phage mid is typically stronger than the one from the, for the helper phage. So this is going to be Enrich, you're going to enrich for keeping this phage mid around. There's also some other technical reasons why you might want to use a phage mid, so more on it in my blog posts and stuff. But you can do things like introduce amber suppression mutations so you can make soluble versions of it. If you have this, you introduce a stop codon that is, can be recognized as not a stop codon if you grow it in certain bacterial strains, it'll like keep going through and make the whole um, and make the whole fusion protein on the on the phage. But if you stick it in amber, um, if you stick it in non-suppressor um, strains, then a stop codon will be recognized. And so you can have 
this soluble version of the protein made. And they typically tend to transfect better in various things. Um, so lots more on this and then the history in my blog post. Speaking of the history, so as I mentioned, um, this won the 2018 Nobel Prize, um, George Smith and Sir Gregory Winter. Um, they each got a quarter share in 2018 and the other half was shared by Francis Arnold. So Smith and Winter got this for phage display of peptides and antibodies. George Smith um, did this proof of concept in 1985. And then Gregory Winter really um, has done a lot of work with designing antibodies using it. Um, I'm not going to get too much into the historical stuff. There's more on it in my blog post, but I just I don't, I want to make sure I get everything right and that sort of thing. Um, but they should also, I want to give a shout out to, um, so George Smith in his Nobel lecture, which is really good. He gives a shout out to some of the key people in his lab who did the work. So Steve Parmley dis developed a practical phase display vector and affinity selection as a grad student. So heck yes. Um, and then the postdoc, Jamie Scott, um, showed that you could do the affinity selection of peptides from random peptide libraries. And Robert Davis, chief manager and technician, sequenced the sequences of this hit. And so I'm sure there were a lot, a lot more people that were involved in this. And there's been a lot of work done since then and continues to be a lot of work optimizing things and doing variations. We'll talk about some of the various variations um, that we used. But because science is always a team sport and that sort of thing. But I also want to make sure that we got that I give credit where credit's due um, when I know where credit is due. Um, so, yeah, so really cool stuff.